The wood shop is sponsored by Shopware Kits and Easy Wood Tools. All right, welcome back. I uh, we're going to turn a duck call today. Actually, I'm going to do two of them. So I have some cocoa bowl here. I pre-drill them. I use a black point bit to drill these out. It's um, it keeps the bolt nice and straight. So I use a thin chuck. You've probably seen that before. And if you use a regular bit, sometimes they get a little off off center and they don't work as well. So we're gonna make duck call use a brad point bit. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to fit the bands on it too. And then I use for the inserts, I use uh, echo call. And I use their their inserts. I'll show you how. Show you those, and I'll give a link to their website. All right. Do anybody have any questions about duck calls or, or you know, wanting to turn for a while or finishes on them? I know I've talked to Terry quite a bit about uh, putting different finishes on them to make sure they hold up. And you can unmute your microphones now and ask questions or whatever. All right. So the you want to use a good hardwood. The cocoa bowl is great. It has a lot of oils in it. I wouldn't use soft woods on them. They just don't hold up out out in the weather. They get rained on. You're blowing in these things. There's you know saliva and stuff inside of them. So you want to use a nice hardwood with a lot of natural oil in it already. All right, and cocoa bowl is a, a great wood for that. It's uh, a little bit of safety before before I get started. Some people have allergic reactions to cocoa bolo, and you want to want to wear a respirator. I turn this stuff quite a bit, and I don't have any reactions to it. But if you do, it's better safe than sorry. So I would say respiratory plenty of ventilation, and it'll cause rash and respiratory problems too. And there's some other woods that are like that too. So definitely take the safety precautions if you if you're going to turn this stuff. All right, and I'm going to show you the pin check. So I'm going to switch over to the other camera now. And go ahead and get everything set up. I'll show you how the pin chuck works. It's just a slick little thing. They make them for um, uh, doing bottle stoppers, but I made my own years ago for just for duck calls because it was uh, it's a, just an easy way to turn them. All right. So here's the pin chuck. It's just a five eighth inch rod, and I milled out a little flat spot on the side of it here. And just take a pin. I, this is actually a, a framing nail that I went ahead and ground this down. And so that framing nail is, is the same height as the top of the center of this. So when it rolls over, you put your piece of wood on there. And it, when it rolls over, that pin rolls in there and locks the piece of wood in. I just trued this one up because I'm just going to put the band on it. but Get it on there, roll it over, and it locks it in nice and tight, and you can turn it. And to get it off, just spin it back, and it pops right out. So let's go ahead and true this one up. Oh, there it goes. All right, it's just the pin had not rolled over yet. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. All right, so I'm just going to – I bring the tailstock up. I have a the live center here, and I took the, the center point out bring this up and it fits perfect in right on the end of this. I actually took the the rod here and sanded it down a little bit to bring it bring it down to a little bit of a point so it fit right in there just like that. And it just sturdies it up and and makes it a little, little more stable. All right. So I'm just going to true it up real quick. I'm going to not I'm going to this is the one I'm not going to put a band on. I'm just going to just going to make a duck call real quick out of this one and as I'm going along if you have any questions just ask and I'll, I'll uh, stop the lathe or whatever. I run the, the speed about 1800 on this it's just a little piece of wood it's, and the faster it's going and cuts nice and clean. All right.
All right, and the other thing I forgot to mention was I normally make them about two and three quarter inches long. So I start out with a three inch piece, and then as I'm rounding it over and cleaning up the ends, I, I my finish length is about two and three quarters. All right, so they're pretty quick. They're they're just they probably take you know I mean if you're not filming and everything else, it's probably probably about a 15 20 minute project. All right, so I'm just going to, I usually take and make this the, the bell side and this the mouthpiece side. And the other thing is, too, when you're making the mouthpiece on them, make them nice and round so they're comfortable. Don't, don't bring them to a point. I, I don't duck hunt, but I have a lot of friends who do, and I've made, it, made a lot of these for them, and they like the ones that are nice, nice and smooth. All right. So what I normally do is I make a spot on it for the for the lanyard and I'm not sure if you know lanyards the thing that goes around your neck that holds a they usually have a bunch of different calls so you make a little spot on there and they can put it so they can hang it from their lanyard so I'm just going to do that All right. Now what I do is roll them out here. Do that. I bring it out just a little bit so I can clean up the end. And then bring it out a little bit more, and then you can sand right inside of there. And I'll just flip it around now and clean up the other end real quick. Actually, I'm going to make that little, <clears throat> little spot for the lanyard a little bit, a little bit deeper. That is basically it. I mean, it goes pretty quick. There's, I just sand, sand it up. So there's a couple different ways. You can seal these with wax, with uh, a beeswax. 
I actually have a crock pot, so if I'm going to do that, I'll just sand it up with my normal normal wax mixture. I heat up the crock pot, throw it in there, and that way it gets to finish all the way down on the inside too. But if you're going to do that, um, it's kind of hard to get it out of the inside, so you kind of need to put it in the crock pot, pull it out, set it up so it it drains out the bottom and I usually take a dowel and stick it down in there to try and clean a, a lot of it out because it's hard to get back on here if you let that that beeswax harden up on the inside and then I just polish it up with a rag but if you want to use a polyurethane or whatever just dry sand it and it works out great just do a wipe on polyurethane you just want to make sure you, you get finished down on the inside too even with the cocoa bowl, it's it's something that needs to be finished inside and out. All right, I'll show you real quick. I had a couple of questions on the last show about how to fit a a uh, a band or band. I put a ferrule on on something. I'll show you that real quick. I set my calipers to my diameter, and this one is really close. I already tested a little bit, and so the band band's going to come way out here. What I normally do is take a little teeny cut on the on the end here and check that. Make sure that's right before I keep going and, and bring the rest of it down. That way if it does if I do make it too loose I can adjust it a little bit further down. I do the same thing with with box lids and stuff when I'm trying to get a nice tight fit. I always just do a little bit on the edge and then fit the box and if it if it it's nice and tight, then I can I can do the rest of the tenon. So basically the same thing. I think I just hit a little bit too much. Yeah. So. Then I can adjust it a little bit. Hopefully you can see that. So that one was just a little bit too loose, so I'm just gradually keep going up. Hey, Carl. Yeah. How wide is that parting tool? Pardon me? How wide is that parting tool? This one is, uh, I believe it's eight. Yeah, it's an eighth-inch parting tool. So that's three millimeters, right? It's pardon me. That's about three millimeters, right? You know what? I'm not. I'm not sure. Is that the calculation for it? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. All right. Well, just in case, as a little, just finished this uh, today. As a little idea from your uh, wire telephone wire casting. Oh, nice. Very nice. It's, it's still, the epoxy is still setting. Uh, all right, so just going to, I'll check that real quick, but I think that's still a little bit, a little bit high. All right. right on there and then I can go ahead and do the rest of it. Just a little bit tight. 
and I'll go ahead and sand it down a little, just a little bit to make it fit. So with these bands, this one right here is this kind of a really neat decorative band. Hopefully you can see that. I got this from a guy back east, and he makes these. They're pretty cool. I'll try and find the link and put that in the in the video after I re-upload it too. But if you're gonna do a band, you want to put pins in it because of the wood swelling and shrinking. And he suggested a lot of times they just put two pins on it, and what happens is they start they rock back and forth even after you know even if you put the two pins in it. So he suggests putting three pins in it. That way it stays nice and tight all, all the time. All right, I'll sand that down just a little bit, so get that to fit. But and I usually use a uh, epoxy on the uh, on the bands. I don't don't use uh, you know Gorilla Glue or anything. I I put the epoxy on, and then I I put the pins in it. And what you want to do is get it to where it's it's tight. I mean, almost too tight to put on with your hand. And I take it over to the drill press and press them on. Yeah. So it just makes it makes it. Uh, yeah. See, that's it'll go on if I if I take it over to the drill press. So you want to just make sure they're on there good and tight because it is gonna even though it's Coco Bolo, they do you know. They're out in the weather a lot, so they're gonna gonna swell and shrink a little bit, depending on what time of year it is. All right, so that's that was the question was was how do I get lids and and things like this to fit, and to make sure I, I you don't go too far on the first time. It's, I make that. Hopefully you can see that it's just a little bit little bit of a, a taper there, and what I'll normally do on something like this or a box is I will come over. To compensate that, so I take that off. I'll come over a little bit more, and then clean that off after I get the band on and cut, and then resand it, so that it doesn't have that taper at the end of the band when you're when you're looking down. It's nice and flush. All right, and then on on these two, same thing. I just take and make a spot for a lanyard on it. I'll do that real quick. Carl, is that band just decorative? Yeah, well, it, you know what? They actually do help quite a bit. Um, and some people like them. All right, because they, depending on what what kind of wood it is, too. If you know, I mean, if they're going to crack, they're going to crack around the around the mouthpiece or around the around where the bell goes in. So the band actually helps it out a lot too. Even if it does crack, it'll the band will keep it together. Okay. So. You know, you might get some hairline little cracks in there, and that'll that'll help out the band. It'll keep it keep it nice and tight because the bell is it fits in there, and it has a little rubber rubber insert there. Hopefully, you can see that, and that's what locks it in. So if this were to crack and, and spread out a little bit, this might not fit in there nice and nice and tight, that's and good. that band will band will keep it on there. So. I, a lot of people, I think they used to use them all the time, and they would just use regular, uh, regular brass ring. But now they have some really cool ones like, like that. And it, can you see that? Uh, the detail's not real good, but yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll throw a picture up on the, on the video after I re-upload it. But he hand makes all of these. You have metal lathe, and, and they're just cool. He has a couple different styles too. But yeah, they they look nice, and they're nice nice uh, thick bands. They're not like uh, just copper right. or, little, or little brass rings. Not they're a plumbing cool. fixture. What? Not a plumbing fixture. You're right, right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you uh, you have any more any questions, or do you want me to finish this one real quick, or? Yes. Yes, please. You want me to finish that? Well, could I ask a question, please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just one question. Well, did you have access to a milling machine to do the flat on the bar? Or yeah. did you do it with maybe an angle grinder? Okay, hang on a sec. I did it with... Pull this out of here and I'll show you real quick. The first one... This is the first one I made. 
Hang on a second. You know, can you guys see from the overhead better the yeah. camera coming down on the lathe? Yes. All right. So this is the first one I ever made, and I did it all by hand. I took it over on my grinder and just ground down a spot. But when you do that, what it does is it cups out this this spot in here. So it, it, it makes a little cup. So what I did was I came down into the into the center there until my little pin was the same height as as the the top here and then I took a, a hand file and filed it down the edges here and then I used to work at for Freightliner the truck manufacturer so I went to work and after I made it and it worked out great so I went in there and I actually had them make me a couple of them and they they did they had a milling machine they just threw this bar on there and it was done in 10, 15 minutes. So if you have access to a milling machine, it's a lot less work, Brendan. Yeah, I'm, I have two mates who are engineers, so they can sort that out very easily for me now. That'd yeah, be fun. yeah, that that would be the way to go. It's 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 going to be a lot more precise too, and you can find a pin. Uh, like I said before, this is just a, a framing nail that I yeah. I had laying around, so I cut it off and and went down to that height. Ah. I need to find that, um, but yeah, it could be a, it'll be a lot more precise with a milling machine. Okay, thank you. Last question, please. What diameter is the bar, please? It's five eighths. Okay, thank you. So I'm not I'm not sure what that is. Uh, no, we work five eighths metric. We work imperial on metric, so we're okay. Okay, all right. He's in Ireland. I'm in the Netherlands, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Like I said before, some of the softer woods too. Well, I use a the Brad point that I have. I believe it's it might be a little bit off, but I believe it's five eighths too. So on the hard cocoa bowls like this, it works out perfect and it's nice and tight in there. But if I've tried to make them out of maple and stuff, and I did, I had to wrap a piece of tape around it and then stick it on because they're just it it doesn't make a nice clean cut. It's just a soft, you know, a softer wood unless you, you know, went with a hard rock maple or something. But I've tried to make them with a bunch of different woods, and the softer woods, they just kind of, they're just not tight like like they are on this one. And I, with this this little pin chuck system, it's kind of nice because I I was making uh, uh, goose calls too, and there are seven eights. So I went went back to work and had had them make me a seven eight inch rod too, the same way. And they just it's just a slick way. You just drill a hole in it, slot them on there, and, and like I said, 15, 20 minutes, it's done. And if you wanted to, you could even go with a larger rod if you wanted to use it for boxes or something like that. Well, right. what's, what's the bar made of? Is it stainless or? Um, I just I, it's just regular bar stock. It's not stainless. It's just I picked it up at the at the hardware store. It's not. I mean, I, if it was stainless or something, it'd probably be probably be a lot a uh, lot cleaner and, and probably more true. This is, you know, I mean, this is just regular bar stock I grabbed there. So right. if you went with a higher quality, you know, steel it would be better. All right, and. So I can finish turning this one real quick and show you that. <laughs> hey, Mike. Hi, Carl. How you doing? <clears throat> I don't think it's got anything to, anything to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been All trying right. to get on for the last 10 minutes. Sorry. I'll shut up. <laughs> All right. So... It's all right. We're we're old and we trying to figure all this stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what I do on the ones with the bands is I do the same thing. I put a spot for the lanyard, but I come up here and leave a little bit of a, a lip there so that this seats up against it. I'll do that real quick.
really magnetize the. It should really magnetize the rod. I'm always dropping those pins in the shavings. I'll sand, the, sand this one up a little bit. Just kind of show you. So, and I normally, like I was saying before, I normally flip it around or reverse the lathe back and forth when I'm sanding. Through, I go, you know, switch it back and forth from each grit. But on this, I, what I do is I. Sand it this way, and then I'll sand it real quick. Hang on, and then I pull the call off and spin it around so I can sand the other end. Is it true that you only just sand up to 240 grit, Carl? Sand to what? 40 grit? Is it, yeah, is that all you ever do, up to 240 grit? You have to go past that? No, is that all you go to, always? No, to 240? Yeah. It's always 600. Really? I never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been having a lot of fun with the... the Yo, I got those micro mesh things, and man, I mean, you hardly have to put a finish on with those things. Don't they? Excellent, don't they? Yeah. I don't think they're a waste of money, to be honest. Really? You know what? Yeah. Uh, yes, really. I think they're a, a big waste of money. You can get better results um, just with normal automotive stuff. Go get a few uh, sheets of uh, 3M sandpaper, the wet and dry stuff. Um, at least what I do on my dressing casting is go to, I usually dry sand to 240, depending on how rough the surface is, wet sand with 240, then take it up to 400, 600, 800, uh, 1000, and if I feel fancy about 1200. Well, after that, all I use is a little bit Macquarie's um, plastics. That brings, it, that brings it out to a mirror polish. Oh, really? Yeah, I've never used the the automotive yeah. uh, sandpaper. Yeah, j j just your regular black stuff works perfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I'll have to try that because that's probably a lot cheaper than the than the mesh. Yeah. Tab. I, I've tried micro mesh. It, it works, but little little pieces they clog up and it's it's expensive to replace. So, you know, yeah. out of body shops, it doesn't cost you anything really. Yeah. Yeah. I uh. I re no, I just really been liking the finish doing working with acrylic with them and and the paint paint stuff I I do it it works out nice for those but yeah I'll try the I do have some automotive sandpaper too. I mean it's basically the same thing if you have a little foam backing pad. It's perfect. Yeah. That, that's all you want. If you got a little foam backing, then it'll it'll perform just as uh, as a little micro or mesh cloth uh, spray. Huh. Oh, well, yeah, for, for a couple of pens, it's quite good. I shan't replace them, and I'll just, just get some uh, wet and dry sandpaper from now on. Uh, tr trust me, I can show you. Uh, I do trust you. Time. I trust, trust you implicitly. It's <laughs> very <laughs> fun to be in a call with my two favorite router. Right? <laughs> so right. Is that Carl and, Carl and who else? <laughs> Mike. <laughs> you are. <laughs> If I can find the things. <clears throat> All right, that's pretty close. All right, so that's that's what I do with the duck calls. I was, uh, you know, like I said before, I, I reverse the lathe and sand back and forth. But with these, just flip it back and forth like that and go through the grits, and, and it works out great. So, and you, you're going to need to sand both ends anyway, so there's no need to no need to reverse it. And this is 
Man, it's got a lot of orange in it. And it looks like really deep purple. That's gonna gonna be nice. It does All right. look beautiful. Looks beautiful. Yeah, I'm not sure how well it's show showing up here on the camera. Is that better? No, it's fine. It's fine. All right. Um, okay, well I'm not gonna I need to finish the whole thing before I press the press the band on, but but that that is about it. And like I said, you know, I mean, if you know some duck uh, duck hunters or whatever, these are these are great, and they're really they really are. They don't take much time at all to make them, and they sell pretty well. They uh, and they uh, actually get a, get a decent price for them too. There's uh, yeah, if you they do make a jig for making these bells. It's a metal jig, and you can cut them out on the bandsaw. So what you do is turn this this bell. This is called the bell. You turn that just just straight out here, and there's a jig that you slide them slide them into, clamp them down, and then take it on the bandsaw, and it actually it just has an arc to it. And you just cut that arc out, and then buy your own reeds, and and a little, you can buy all these little parts for it too. So if you really want to get into call making. That, that's a. I, w I would recommend getting getting one of those little jigs. It, would, it really adds a lot to it if the whole thing's turned. But I don't. I don't make a whole lot of them. So and I think they're they're about two hundred bucks for the jig. Oh. But, but I, you know, I mean, if the whole calls turn. You you get a lot more money if you're if you're selling them too. So but, and I don't know how to. I'm not a duck hunter. <laughs> I can't. Really? Can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> That's very sexy, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> but I would do if you if you did want to uh, uh, make a few of them. These things I I get them. I'll put the link link in there to to uh, it's Echo Calls and they're they're out of the U.S. But these things are I think they're like five or six bucks. And they have a variety of colors, and and uh, they have a double read and a single read. And I, I think they make some other stuff, or I know they make the goose calls, but I I've made a few of them and had people use them, and, and they didn't really didn't like them. I think I probably made 15 of them total. It wasn't wasn't, uh, wasn't some people were really interested in. But the duck calls are, you know, there's a lot of duck hunters out there. All right. Anything else? Yeah, I'm Carl. Just... Sorry. Go on. After you. Okay, thank you, Carl. What is the finished diameter of the duck call? About one and a quarter inches. It is. It's two and three quarter inches long. Is what I what I shoot for. I start out with with. Uh, let me see here. I normally start out with with almost a three inch blank is what I was cutting them at. These ones, I barely took anything off the end, but I usually start out with about a three inch, and I shoot for two and three quarters for final, final uh, length on them. Hang on, look for a tape measure. And the, the diameter is. Your verniers. Mike, can you bring me a tape measure over? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> Just hold it up to the screen. Go on, hold it up to the screen. We, we can work this out. Go on. <laughs> All right. So finished diameter is just over an inch, but that okay. you, know, you can you can vary that too. The only thing that's critical is the the uh, the hole in the center to fit the inserts. The rest of it, I, I wouldn't make them much longer than this. I've looked at a lot of duck calls, and they they're all pretty much right in that that. Two and a, two and three quarter to to three inch di uh, length, but you can do whatever you want with the outside. It's not going to affect the sound. That's you know that's the only thing. I would just make it comfortable to hold on to, and I think that's about it. Just one little tip: if you're going the automotive sandpaper uh, thingy, if you're going to work with acrylics that have a darker color into it, try and work your way all up to two thousand. Don't skip a grit. Just work up to two thousand. Okay. If you if you polish it out with a normal auto, automotive polish or I think it's hot hot polish whatever you use in the U.S. you can actually get like mirror finishes like this. Oh wow! Hang on a second. Let me. 
And this is just a little epoxy. I don't think it's a focus one. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's good. That's a little mic casting that I did. Just brought some epoxy and some uh, mica powder, which is also cheaper than Pearl X. It's just mica powder. Search for it on eBay. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, I use the, the ultra gloss stuff is what I've been putting it on after I do the do the mesh pads. But yeah, I'll try that. I actually have some sandpaper. I don't. I think it only goes up to 800 or something. But, but yeah, that stuff stuff's not too expensive. Yeah. But yeah, on on dark acrylics, don't skip grits. You'll, you'll you especially if it's dark, you'll see the lines in the end. Mm. And if you never worked with Triple E Ultra Shine, I think you have Mike. Not triple E, no. I haven't. I use T cut. Oh, what? That's an automated polish. You see, I'm nearly there. I've just got to get the sandpaper now, and I'd be fully operational. No, I'm I'm meant for wood using a triple E cut. It's a U butte finishes. It's an Australian yeah, no. brand. Yeah, I, I've heard of it. I've never used it. Have you used it, Carl? Has anybody else used it? No, I have. It's supposed to be pretty good. It is pretty good. Mm. It really does work. It finishes off real easy. Just yeah. sand up to about 600, so your normal car standard, and <laughs> put that over and it shines it right up. Yeah. And it fills in the pores, so that's good. I don't know. I've seen, seen a couple people use it, but I've never, never tried it. Whenever I finish acrylics, I use Brasso or Silver, mm. Mm. and it brings them up really well. Yeah. I think metal it's polish will do. Yeah, it's it's all it's all got a very very fine abrasive in it, hasn't it really? And and that's what what does the job is the abrasive, and then it breaks the abrasive down, and then uh, that's what gives you the finish you're looking for. So I understand. An engineer an engineer told me that most polish we need is in under the kitchen sink. But any household polish will do the job. Yeah, yeah. No, that's all right. My mind is working overtime. <laughs> you, you you use it over the top of like a CA finish too? No, no. I I would do all the micro mesh first, and then I would run over the top of the blank with either Silvo or Brasso, whichever one I have. Now I don't buy it as a liquid. I buy it as a felt pad. There's a little tin you can get, and yeah. it has the stuff like a wad inside it. And right. you can pull, pull some out, use it, and dump it then. So you're not going to keep residue going back into the bottle or the tin or anything, you know. So it means it lasts a long, long time. I've got a small tin about three inches high and an inch and a half in diameter, and I have it for 10 years. And I'm still only halfway through it. You've tried it a little time. I think, I think there are a lot of different products on the market which are marketed uh, for profit if you like and they are the supposed to be the end you know the be all and an end all but there are substitutes everywhere for everything I think and it's a case of experimentation isn't it really yeah Carl when you're turning the duct call how you're turning for the insert how you're turning it on that inside groove does it make a difference in the sound that the duct call will make for like the lanyard part of it yeah no, it's it really doesn't. It it really doesn't. Nothing out here is going to really affect it. It's basically basically just the tube and and the reeds. It's all coming out the back. I'm not sure. I mean, I guess maybe a little bit if it was a really soft wood compared to a dense wood. I think, but I I don't know. I'm not a professional, you know, <laughs> call call maker or anything, but. I just I, I don't know if there's that much of a difference. I just I, I know they use the harder woods and it's for they're going to hold up a lot better. It's just the oil in them is going to going to prevent them from rotting. But even even with these, when you you get home, you need they need to be wiped out and, and taken apart, and so that moisture doesn't stay inside of them. But I yeah I don't I don't know whether it affects it a little bit or I I don't think so though. I've never heard anybody say you know, that it was too thick on a certain point and it, it sounded weird. Carl, how long ago was it that I watched you making your first duck calls on YouTube? <laughs> way, way too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, this is funny. I uh, I can't remember what we were doing, but I went back and and watched that video again. Wow, that was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard to hard to watch. I, one of the comments on there was, "Please don't put anything else up again. You're gonna hurt yourself." Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I was. I went back and I don't know I don't know why but we were messing around and we went back and watched like the four, first four or five videos and I don't even think I was on the camera it just started out with just the, you know shot of the lay and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a duck call and then you know or whatever it was but yeah I was like all embarrassed and <laughs> didn't want to didn't even want to be on camera but yeah they were they were bad and then yeah, it's but... probably coming up on seven years. Seven, eight years? Yeah, that would be right, yeah. 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 But the thing is, at that time, there were only about two people actually putting videos up, and you were one of them. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, other, the other guy was good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it was yeah. That's the whole reason I started was was somebody wanted uh, a duck call at work, and I had no idea. I'd never made one before, and, and so he brought one into work, and I go, well, let me take it home and try. So I went online and tried to look up, you know, how to make them, and there was there was nothing. There was nothing out there, and I took it back to work, and he was just like amazed that, you know, I mean, you watch it, you know, I've been doing it a long time now, but. And it's pretty easy, but he was just amazed that I, you know, could, could run home and, and turn that thing. So I figured, you know what? I don't know. Maybe somebody else wants to see how to do it. Yeah. And it's a good, it's a good thing you did it, Carl. <laughs> may I say? No, I'm serious. Dead serious. For once, I'm being serious. <laughs> uh, I don't. Well, uh, it's a great, it's a great resource, YouTube. In the end, that really got me started into woodworking. Well, we've been busy building little things out of MDF, and I watched, uh, uh, I think all, back then all of the movies of um, Steve Ramsey, and I watched some wood turning, and all of a sudden I had, like, I need to do more wood turning, <laughs> more woodworking in, in general, so that really got me started, but, mm -hmm. you know, little camera space, I need, still need to set something. You know? yeah. I got a little late. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. There's so much stuff out there now, and, and so many people, you know, sharing so many different things, you know. I mean, what they're what they're good at, it's 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 great. But it, it, it's a real good source for learning as well to see how other people use the tools. And yeah. that, I, I knew that's that's the hardest part I tried to uh, search for is how what position do people hold the tools in? Mm. Right. That that's the main issue. If, if you're beginning to with turning, I didn't go. Uh, I didn't get any class or anything. I just bought one and you know went at it. Went pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's a great resource to you know, if you're just starting out or or even to just get ideas. I mean, I I still watch I watch videos all the time to get ideas from other people and stuff. You you know, I mean, I've turned a bunch of stuff. I I never turned a goblet until I saw Mike do it, and I figured, you know, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I think the thing is the thing is with YouTube is that one of the finest things is as you say, you you're always learning of other people. And it doesn't matter how long. I've only been doing it for a couple of years, but people like yourself have been doing it for years. There are people who have been doing it for 20 years, 30 years. But then you get someone like Sam Angelo, who has been in wood for 30 odd years, and he's cut his damn finger off on a table saw. You know, um, and the, you know, it's a serious thing. It, and he's always on about safety. You can never ever be too safe. And you can never learn everything, you know. That's what's beautiful about it. You just learn in something every day, you know. I think the one I think I know which person you're going about, but yeah, it, it's the one little moment of not paying attention and looking away. That's always what gets you. It is, and you know, I'm, I'm not part of the safety police by any means because I do things off camera that you know you, you cringe at when you think about what you've done. But at the end of the day. Um, the safety is down to you and people who keep on about safety and nothing else at the end of the day it, it can scare people away I mean we have to remember it's a very dangerous anything that's spinning is dangerous but at the end we take the responsibility ourselves and um, if something goes wrong you've got no one to blame but yourself you know 
the only thing I really cr I'm not really worried about fingers getting close to saw blades as long as you know where you place them and <laughs> you've got your safety gear like rifling knives in, in place. The only thing I cringe at is people using cloth on the lathe. That's the only thing I cringe at. Because I've seen that go wrong badly. Yeah. But the, the, there are some turners that have been turning a long time and they use nothing else but cloth. You know, I, I don't particularly like the idea. I agree with you totally. I see but professional ball turners who just uh, just put put it in, and I know you can just hold hold the entire thing, just push it through with one hand. Mm. Yeah. Like no, 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 no. And I mean, <laughs> ball turners, big ones. Yeah. yeah. But it is. You're right, Mike. It's it's up to each of us to, you know, be safe. Be safe, no matter what you see or or you know. Sure. Yeah. Be comfortable with whatever you're doing. Yeah, I, I haven't had any really serious injuries. Um, you know, a couple, couple little close calls. But I think the worst thing that ever ever happened to me was uh, on the table saw, and I, I took a, a carbide tooth in the right in the end of my nose. Really? Yep. Yep. Good grief. Yeah, it. Uh, I, I have no idea what happened. It it, uh, it slid the board up there, it just touched it, and I was home alone. And all of a sudden, I just I just got a hot flash. It was like you know I got really lightheaded, and I I didn't even know what happened. I mean, it was just you know it's that fast. I had no idea what what happened, and all of a sudden I just see blood <laughs> dripping down on the floor. Well, the yeah. uh, the blade the blade shed a tooth. Yep. It, Tooth popped popped off and it actually oh. embedded itself in the tip of my nose. Good I went into, the, went into the bathroom, got some, you know, rag and, and hit it, and it was hard. And I thought it was a piece of wood. I thought, you know, a splinter went in there, and uh, grabbed the tweezers and I hit it, and it went pink. And I, wow, wow. Good grief. I there a little bit was sticking out, and I grabbed a hold of it and pulled it out, and I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> it, it was big. <laughs> You're very lucky. He didn't hit you in the eye, mate. Very uh, lucky. Yeah. You know what? I, I was wearing glasses, glasses and safety glasses and everything. But you know, I mean, it, it was probably 15 plus years ago, and you know, I don't know. I I didn't I didn't probably wear gla safety glasses all the time every time I turned that leg. No. People saw on back then, and I know I'm positive I didn't. But I had them on, and yeah, it, you know, an inch either way, and I would have lost an eye. But yeah. I just, I never, I never, to this day, I never turn that thing on without glasses on. Yeah, you, well, it, that's the way to learn, but you're lucky you got away with it, if yeah. you like. Yeah. Mike, it's more common than you might think, because there's a guy about 10 miles from me, and his business is replacing the carbide tips on saw blades. Good grief! Wow. You're kidding. Yeah, that's he does all day long. Replaces tips, so it happens more often than you might think. I didn't so. realize that until I was told to buy blades off him, and then I asked what his business was. And the, the engineer friend said he puts tips back on the saw blades. They come off all the time. Good Man. grief! Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't know. I don't check them all the time, but I've I've never had one come off. You know, since then. <clears throat> I'm always just, you know, I always put my glasses on. I always mm. turn it on and stand off to the side while it's, while it's firing up, too. I don't feel Well, after hearing that, Brendan, anybody want to buy a new Bosch table saw? <laughs> 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 How are you liking that thing? I've been looking at a metabolism. Oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, yeah. I'm yeah, very I love the sliding it. table on that. That's nice. Yeah, well, I've got, I've got nothing to compare it to apart from a very cheap, um, I suppose in the States you'd say Harbor Freight, I suppose. We have a Wix's over here, which is a, a sort of a um, a builder's merchant that does other stuff, you know, which is cheap. But, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. But um, it, I haven't found anything wrong with it yet, but I say I've got nothing to uh, compare it to, you know. Oh, looks nice. Great looking saw. Now, now, now that I'm about accidents, uh, I actually managed to get like two, three stitches in the side of my wrist here uh, by uh, accidentally stuffing a um, what do you call it? 
The one you show up show in your lathe tools on. Grinder? Grind. The grinder, grinder. Yeah. I grind it. On my freaking grinder wheel. That, that's nice. I think we've all had grinder burns, though, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, but I thought it was a grinder burn because you know, I, I wanted to quickly <laughs> do up a roughing gouge quickly, mm. not, not the word quickly, and not, not take it out and just put it under the bench, which was totally fine, but then it sort of tipped over and I pushed it back, but then I forgot that there was not enough space for my wrist and the top of the workbench. So I <laughs> the uh, grinder with my wrist, which uh, I thought was a little burn, but then I'm like, grip, grip, I'm like, nope, it's not good. <laughs> so yeah, that works through stitches. Oh. And a nice car. Something to talk about. <laughs> Could have what, been worse. What's missing on the wall, Carl? What? This, this, What's missing on the wall behind for this week's competition? <laughs> well, look, I was doing some. I was doing spring cleaning, and look what I found. Spring cleaning. Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 nice one. Oh, I figured I'd throw that up there too. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the off the air real quick, but we're, we'll all still be here. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Right. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you.